the young people in San Diego need to channel their efforts into more constructive means. We cannot build by destroying, we can only build by building. If you look at the different types of reparations that this task force is advocating for, it's actually reparations that will benefit all of the black community, regardless of where we come from within the diaspora. And so that's something I would like to see um, the black community, especially the California black community, um, unite more on. Anybody else want to touch on that? Um, when talking about unity, I would say that one of the most important things, um, to me at least, is to bridge those generational gaps. Um, I think it's one of the more uh, trying things of this time when we're talking about unifying our community. Also, like specifically with the black community here on campus of students, unity is not so great, but there's a lot of people working towards building those bridges and making sure that we are all um, we are all seeing each other as family and seeing each other as people with common struggles, common differences. So, yeah, thank you. Absolutely. Um, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a businessman, so I think that uh, the opportunity is in business and a better unity to, to help stretch our dollar. So there's a number of statistics in terms of how we recycle our dollars, and we're probably the worst. Uh, it stays in our community for uh, less than a day, whereas other communities do a better job of recycling it, where it stays in the community for a month before others have access to it. So that's definitely one area I see that us coming together and having a strategy and, and a specific purpose can help us tremendously. Okay. And thank you guys for those answers. Do you guys feel like it's important for us to be more unified as we move into these other spaces where maybe we are the minority. Um, I know with you being in marketing and then also with you being in the political space, you don't, you don't see a lot of us. So how important is us kind of getting stuff together on the home front? Um, <clears throat> I can take this one. So I spent uh, over a decade in corporate America up until last year. And I think that is a space where you know, we have different generations, as you mentioned, um, in the business community, as you mentioned. But in my personal experience, there's not a lot of unity <laughs> in, that, in that particular space. And I think that's a missed opportunity. Um, it prevents us from really lifting as we climb, as they say. Um, and so I think that there's a certain way that potentially um, older generations had to operate in order to climb the ranks in spaces like corporate America. And now um, you have younger folks entering that space and they're being challenged on how they're showing up because it's different. Um, it's different. And so what I would like to see is while we're in that space, um, those that have climbed the ranks to really pull down and, and allow the folks who are entering the space to really show up authentically and although that might not look like how um, you were able to show up because the times were different, I want to see more um, unity in terms of respecting uh, that things have changed and, and being a shoulder that folks can cry on or lean on um, as they're navigating spaces, predominantly white spaces like corporate America. Anybody else can touch on that? Yeah, I think, I think, one, the generational gaps are always going to, as long as humans are humans, they're always going to exist. I think with the media outlets and technology, we just see more of it. And you can offer more opinion uh, in terms of young people talking about old people or old people talking about young people. So they've always existed, you know. That's just the way humans in the world work. So I do think that it requires a greater degree of compassion, empathy, sympathy, and understanding. And so um, I have been in the business of really having to relate to younger people. And so it's not a problem for me because that's just in my spirit, that's kind of who I am. And, and one of the privileges I think that weren't is age. You know, because I hate when people, you know, I had a beard and I had to get rid of my beard because I couldn't handle the misters. 
you know, it made me feel old, and I didn't want to feel old, and I, I kind of, well, one, I had a great beard, then I colored it uh, to, to uh, amber uh, to make it look like I was a red bone from New Orleans or something like that, and then I just got rid of it. I saw myself on film, and I said, ooh, I kind of look old, and so I got rid of it. So I think that, that that's really what it takes. It's just a better understanding and creating more conversations like this where there's dialogue between older and younger people because as older people, we understood it because we went through that time. But younger people don't quite understand where we're coming from because they haven't gone through the future of time. So I think the onus is really on the older people to be more sympathetic, empathetic in corporate environments, parents, me as a, as a, as I hate to say the G word, but you know, when your daughter has kids, you know, that person, and then also an uncle, an old, you know, I had had a conversation with my, my, my nephew about, oh, you 30, I didn't even know you was 30, we gotta have a real talk, brother, you know, what, what you doing with your life, that kind of, and he hasn't called me in a week, you know, that, that kind of thing, so I, I, that's what I believe, it's unity, but it's also understanding, compassion, togetherness, to once again get what uh, Brother Gerard talked about, an ally, advocacy, and all that, and I think we'll get better. Right. And I think a lot of times it's also understanding our differences and stuff, in order to, because you have to accept someone's differences to be able to sit with them, and I think that's one of the most important things. So I do want to, since you guys opened it up, but go on to the intergenerational conversation. Um, with you being a student here, um, what are, do you feel like are just some misconceptions with your generation that may prevent the older generation from you fighting with, with you guys? So um, I actually do want to touch a little bit on the previous question go ahead. too. Um, from a student standpoint, as someone who went to predominantly non-black institutions my entire life and schools like these where there aren't a lot of people that look like me in my classes, um, unity is the most important thing. Like something like Black Student Union, in my opinion, Black Student Union is more important on campuses like these because we don't have spaces. We have to build our own spaces. So when we have places like uh, the Black Resource Center, where we can go into those spaces, be ourselves. Like there's literally, you can walk in the Black Research Center and see people braiding their hair, I'm braiding their hair, taking wigs off, you know, all of that stuff that we can't do in our classes without looking, being looked down upon. And it's kind of like we have our own space, our own environment to be ourselves. Um, and when you're talking about a misconception um, of our generation, I think a lot of people think that Gen Z complains a lot, or that we want too much. I hear that a lot when we're talking about issues like pronouns and things of that nature, but our quote unquote complaining has been getting a lot of things done that weren't getting done in the past. And I would like for the older generations to kind of appreciate the things that we are trying to work for because we're trying to break those generational curses. And I wanna, I do wanna get the, well I'm gonna ask a different question to you guys, but uh, you mentioned the spaces, so like you being president of the Black Student Union, what do you say when people are like, those spaces are not necessary? <laughs> so I actually just recently had an issue with this because um, me and another sister revamped a program called Talk To Me Sis, which is a peer-to-peer -peer discussion group for black women on this campus. Um, and we were told by the Women's Resource Center that they have a program called Chit Chat um, for all women. And they basically told us, why don't y'all just go to that? Y'all don't need a space um, specifically for black women. Y'all need to come together with all women. But when we're hearing things like that, my issue is that Black people have never been the main on the forefront of any all people mission. And so we've always had to advocate for ourselves. So when people are now coming forward and saying things like we're being exclusive by having our own spaces, it's, you know, I, it sucks to suck, honestly. Like, I should just be straight up. <laughs> And Jennifer, you are an alumna of LaFi, right? So if you want to tell us what the acronym is. Sure. Um, LaFi stands for the LA African American Women's Public Policy Institute. 
Right. It's been around for 20 years now. Yeah, so I bring that up because that's a space where black women are able to unify and then they see into the world where there's not a lot of people, like once again, that look like you. So to you know your point, um, to what Terry was saying, when people are asking, why are those spaces needed? Can you kind of uh, touch on how Law Pi prepared you to be in this world where you are the minority? Sure. Um, I'll also share that the same time that I was, I just completed Law Pi last year. Congratulations. Um, <laughs> thank you. Uh, and while I was um, embarking on my Law Pi journey, I was also at the same time in a program called Emerge California which trains Democratic women to run for office, also has been around for about the same time, 20 years. And was that um, like a race specific or? No, it was just for all women, okay. right? And so a lot of, there's not been a lot of folks who have done both programs and especially not at the same time. But I think in doing so, I was able to see why Law Pi was really, really needed <laughs> is because um, there's, a lot of work, like the issues facing black women, when we take an intersectional approach, an intersectional lens, um, there's, there's still a lot of work to be done in terms of changing systems and how programs are designed that center black women. And a space can be for all women but still center black women in the design. And in that way, it's, it's a program that would benefit all women but in a very extremely inclusive way, right? There's still a lot of work to be done, I would say, of various programs. I would also um, say that this <laughs> take, being in both programs at the same time really helped illuminate uh, how grateful I was to be in both programs. LAPI um, created a space where we could kind of let our hair down. We could um, really talk to each other in a more, from a, a perspective of having similar experiences and to bring light to um, issues in our community that we wouldn't necessarily want to bring to bear in mixed company. Like there are certain things that we want to um, discuss in the privacy of our own community. And especially in LA, especially uh, in the year that we had last year with things like the um, um, leaked audio tapes, right? In, in the LA City Council level. Certain things like that, you want to have the safety of, a, of an all-black space to talk about that and to strategize about how we move forward in a way that centers those who were, who were um, harmed, right? And in that particular instance, it was a black community that was specifically harmed from a political perspective, right? And so that is an example of why I believe that it's important to have uh, specific spaces for black folks. Thank you for that. David, I know the ladies have been talking, but did you want to add on to that at all? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't want to date myself too much, uh, <laughs> but uh, I don't experience that same thing now uh, in terms of there being a breakup or disruption of, of where, wherever the people are wanting to gather and see it as, as exclusive. But we know in, in the not too distant past, there was a uh, a program called COINTEL that destroyed a lot of uh, movements, you know, and so that's kind of a whole, that's a not too distant past. So there's been a, the system has never wanted collusion, it has never wanted unity. So I think it's a byproduct of what was like set forth in the past because, you know, it's more, it, it brings about more power and more power brings about change. And right. so there'll always be those struggles, I believe. You know, it's just being more powerful to overcome those struggles. All right, thank you for that. So I know I asked Terry on the other side about the misconceptions for her generation, but then I want to come to you uh, about the misconceptions that you feel um, the younger generation may have about, uh, or that keep them from wanting to collaborate or be good part with you. They're special and not different than where we were. With, you know, back when we were, you know, young people always are at the front of anything rebellious, change, etc. So if anybody's old, the young people got to realize that they were probably doing the same thing. They weren't old 
for, for decades, <laughs> you know, kind of thing. So I, born. Yeah, I, mean, I wasn't born, you know, and so on. So I think that's the biggest thing, and a lot of that has to do with youth, immaturity, impatience, all the stuff that young people have. So I, it's just natural for that, you know, to, to be. So it's, it's funny when I hear my 19-year-old niece who's uh, at UCLA and becoming socially, politically, economic, I'm like, that's cute. It's like I was when I was 19, you know, keep it moving. My mother don't understand all that, you know, that kind of stuff. So I think it's good, it's healthy, uh, it's inevitable, and we just got to work with it. Right. And then Jennifer, I guess you can serve as our urban <laughs> family, right? So I think it's the, what is it, the reach, or reach forward and pull back, is that? Lift is like climb, sort of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So how do you feel like you can incorporate that, or how have you seen that? Well, um, I've seen that in a number of different ways. Um, in different professions, I'm a certified public accountant, CPA. And literally, Lift Does We Climb is the moniker for the National Association of Black Accountants. In that space, we're seeking to increase the black representation in the public accounting industry. Um, extremely important out of all professions, it's extremely low percentage of black folks that actually hold that designation, and that needs to change. Um, I'm a big believer that money rules everything in, in this country, in this world. And so, right, exactly. So we need more folks who look like us, who understand the history, that we were um, a commodity in this country. And so our relationship with money is complicated, and we need folks who this lived experience to um, to help drive forward what the economy really looks like um, moving forward. But your question was, what does Lift as we kind of look like and how am I gonna embody it? So um, in the campaign world, there's a lot of opportunities for, for folks to engage, uh, for the younger generation to engage, but I don't even speak on the, on the campaign side, I wanna speak on the policy side, on actually the change that we're bringing about the community. Um, one of the policies I'm advocating for currently actually uh, is around infrastructure finance equity. Um, I live in an unincorporated community called Westmont, and there are over a million folks who live in unincorporated communities in LA County. And what that means is you don't have a city council. That means you have to petition directly to the LA to LA County to get your county and municipal services, which is an extremely big disadvantage. Um, and so I'm advocating for a policy to bring sustainable, multi-decade investments to unincorporated communities specifically, because these are communities where a lot of black folks live due to redlining. Um, and right now, we're looking to design a community engagement plan. And it's really important that youth are um, being brought in to lead what that community engagement looks like and to go and educate the communities that they, in the, in the areas that they occupy uh, within those spaces. And so um, that's one way, is making sure that in how we are um, advocating for policy that younger generations are not just being asked what you think, but giving opportunities to lead right. and actually uh, build a pipeline of civic engagement leadership within our communities is extremely important. And so I'll be sharing more information about this opportunity to, this paid opportunity to uh, show up in these unincorporated spaces uh, shortly. All right, thank you for that. Um, we'll pause a little bit. Are there any questions from the audience at all? Do you guys have any questions for our panelists? No, if not, we can keep going. Okay, so transitioning a little bit into, I know we've uh, talked a lot about unifying in the black community. Now, uh, when you guys go out into the world and in your careers, now you guys are especially in the political space, and then you being an entrepreneur and dealing with marketing stuff. Um, you're going into a space where there are a lot of different people. So how does that look? Unifying with um, the people that don't necessarily look like you or they have those different privileges? Um, anybody can grab that. Um, I want to talk about this from a student perspective. Okay. Somebody who's not in a career okay. solidified yet. Uh, my major is Africana Studies with a focus on political development. 
I knew that I was going to major in that when I was a sophomore in high school. Um, every time, outside of school, every time I tell somebody my major, they turn their nose up at it. Um, it's very looked down upon outside of this campus community and the community that I've built on this campus um, of people who look like me, that support me, that understand um, why and what I represent and what I'm fighting for. Um, there's a misconception about Africana Studies being a non-money making major. Uh, I like to kill those stereotypes because it is something that people do make money from, but it's much deeper than that because it's something that you go through life like actually representing this major because um, it, it creates a different understanding of the world. You see the world from a very Afrocentric viewpoint. And um, yeah, so I try to encourage people to minor in Africana studies all the time, but I just wanted to touch on that a little bit. Yeah, I think when I go into the world of, of business, it's, it's kind of easy because if I can have a great exchange of value regardless of who I'm working with, it kind of works at the end of the day. It's not always about money. Uh, sometimes it is, but mostly it's, a, it's an exchange of value. Uh, it's my information that helps them be better and helps them win. It's my product that helps them better and win. Or it's just me being a great teamwork leader, teammate, leader, follower that helped win. So um, I uh, I was on a college campus at one time. I'm a graduate of uh, Cal Berkeley, um, and it was tough being on that campus when I was on it. Uh, but all I had to do was perform and get what I came to get, <laughs> and that was it. And it was so tough. I don't even have one uh, piece of Berkeley paraphernalia in my house. <laughs> so I hear you say that it was tough, but then you put in the work. So I mean, were there the issues? They just they were outstanding. Yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's all the issues that I would hear now. So it didn't change from the mid to late '80s to now. So it's the same stuff. Same stuff. Uh, same stuff. Same game. Same. Same, same system, same ism, same privileges. And would you say that that just meant, because I hear you kind of saying like, you just got to get it done. You, you know? have to get it done yeah. at the end of the day. Uh, at the end of the day, you, you come to a college campus, yes, to learn, but at the end of the road is a degree that you're looking to get. And so you just got to get that. And then I got another degree from a, a master's in business from Michigan. And so that's what I went there for, all the stuff in between, you know, I guess in, you know, if you talk to prison people, they say it's two days to count. The day you go in and the day you go out. So uh, I got both of those. And, and the information, uh, similar to, I forgot your name. Terry. Terry, Terry Shear, that whatever she's doing the Africana studies, mm -hmm. she's gonna uphold that for a lifetime. Right and no one can take it away, and all these other experiences are gonna enable you to have a great life. I don't know about the money, that doesn't matter, but to have a great life. And so that's the important when, you, when you're in your 20s to do something you enjoy, you like, you're going to be good at it, and that you're, you're developing the habits to be good. I, I, you say it, I learn it, I analyze, I apply it, and I create value. I don't care if I'm art history or engineer. That, that formula's gonna happen. But for me, it is about using whatever this purpose is that we're together in business to do so that everyone wins. And I don't care what color you are because I deal with all colors and all nations. Uh, I'm a dual citizen uh, as well. So if I can get everybody around the table and they win, that's what they, that, that, that works. All right, so we have a question from our virtual audience. Yes. So this student is from Spelman College. She has a question, um, it may have been derived from earlier. The question is centered around social media engagement. She said, how do you find a healthy balance of maintaining a professional presence on social media, but also being your authentic self? She, she, she feels as though she's being dr driven to move from her authentic self, which represents her culture, but, and that's gonna be her obstacle in the professional space. So she solicits your feedback on that. So being professional is also authentic. 
uh, yeah, on social media, which they said earlier is a huge tool right now, you know, in the day and age that we live in. So, anybody want to touch on that? Um, I want to first apologize for <laughs> that experience that she's going through. I know what it's like. Um, I can say it doesn't just stop at social media. Um, even, you know, so much is happening virtually now. I recall being in um, Zoom meetings, you know, when I was still in corporate America. And just, I'm a very expressive, I have a very expressive face, as you guys probably already noticed. And I recall being called out of like, oh wow, your, your face, like, oh, you know, you're, you should go off camera, because like your face, when people say stuff. And I, at first, you know, it kind of made me go into my shell more, because I didn't feel like I could show up authentically. Um, and then as I matured, I realized that that was their problem, not my problem, right? But that took, that took time to get to that level. And so I want to impart that same piece of advice. Um, we have to be careful who we let critique us. Yeah. We have to be really careful of who we allow to uh, critique us. Um, and so we can't just say, oh, just jump at every little uh, thing that somebody says. We need to first stop and assess whether they are worthy of critiquing us. Um, and then once we do that assessment, you know, take a look around and see, okay, well, is this person really saying this for my, for my good? Um, let's not get too defensive. They are someone who is worthy of critiquing us. Then let's pause and reflect on whether what they're saying is really for our benefit. Uh, but at the same time, uh, there are consequences when we shape our, ourselves into ways that that placates to society's norms. Um, and so I want to caution against that as well. And I want to encourage you to just show up authentically as yourself. There's always going to be attacks when black folks show up as ourselves. There, there always have been and there always will be. So I want to say um, just be you um, and be careful what you let critique you. Did anyone else want to touch on that? Um, yeah, I do want to touch on it because social media is like really becoming one of the biggest parts of our lives nowadays. Um, as somebody who is part of Gen Z and who kind of grew up seeing social media through all of its stages and become the monster that it has become today, uh, it's difficult to manage sometimes because especially somebody like me who is in a leadership position, a lot of the communication, peer-to-peer -peer communication that happens is through social media. So even if I wanted to delete my Instagram or delete my um, social platforms, I would be kind of putting myself in a box, in a show, and I wouldn't be able to communicate as effectively with my peers, um, which is very unfortunate. I wish we had better ways of communication as it relates to talking to one another, to having actual interactions with one another because I actually value interactions and connections with real life people. Um, one of the ways that I have been able to manage my, at least the peer pressure aspect, the aspect where it's influencing my day to day life, is that I choose to surround myself solely with black media. Um, I don't follow any celebrities that aren't um, don't have the same goals and missions as me as it relates to what I want to do in the future and what I represent. So that's one of the ways that's helped me. Um, yeah, I wish that we did have better ways though. I think there needs to be some type of help in that aspect for sure. May I um, say something about the last question about um, unity with folks that don't like us? Sure. So we're good on the answer here. Yeah. Or did you want yeah, to? Yeah, yeah. As, as a person who multiple decades kind of weaponized thought to make people take action, um, social media is not one's authentic self, for one. Very few people exercise that. Uh, we don't see the bad stuff happening, we only see highlights. Um, but at the same token, we're boxed in a world because of the algorithm. 
So social media is big, but it's very scientific, it's very strategic with yeah. those who control it. Right. So because we know you can get your account, you know, turned off, blocked, and all of that. So uh, I would just say, yeah, be yourself and, and go with the flow. Right. So I hope we were able to answer that question for you. Or this new Matt Spellman, um, Jennifer Jordan. Yeah, I wanted to offer this is this is you know going out to Gen Z millennials, some of which are are at institutes of higher institutions of higher learning. So I wanted to offer a specific strategy on building unity of among folks who don't have our same lived experience. There's um, I was in a, a CEO action for racial equity fellowship right before I left Price Waterhouse Coopers and was a big four public accounting firms. And the whole purpose of this fellowship was to um, advance public policies and corporate engagement strategies for the 47 million black Americans. And, but it was a very mixed group. Um, there was, it was not all black people in that fellowship. And so even among us as fellows who were united in this mission to support black people, we still had to get, we had a lot of work to do to get on the same page with one another about what we were trying to accomplish with what strategies. And so we used um, an approach called targeted universalism. I want to encourage everyone to look this up if you're not familiar with it. Um, and it's an approach where you align on a universal goal that honors and recognizes the humanity. Um, humanity. So we could say like all people deserve housing, a, a right to, or have a right to, to have housing. And then you take data and facts to illustrate how um, that's not the case. Although that's the universal goal that we can all agree on, that is not happening for X, Y, and Z reasons. So you start to lay out all of the data and facts that show, here's how black folks are not living that universal goal. Here's how um, seniors are not using, living up to that universal goal or not being allowed to because of the systems at play. So, I want to offer that approach. It was extremely effective at bringing folks from all across the country, all different races together, to unite on what our solutions would be in that fellowship. Again, a very mixed, mixed fellowship with very uh, lived experiences. And I encourage everyone to do more research on that. And you said targeted universalism. Targeted universalism. Okay. So yeah, remember that targeted universalism. So I want to transition into when we talk about like genders, right? So unifying in that space. Um, and as I've been saying, I think even the black women and black men conversation is a lot different from just the men and women conversation. So we kind of just like flow around that. But um, let's talk about how the, the difficulties maybe of unifying with men as women. Um, that's a good question. Uh, <laughs> This is actually a discourse that we've been having on campus amongst the black student community. Um, we've been having very inclusive conversations amongst the black men and women who go here, the young black men and women who go here, who actually see each other every day. And um, we have a very disconnect with gender in the black community. And one of the things that I've been touching on a lot recently is that black femininity is not as protected as black masculinity. Mm -hmm. um, and that comes with, if you are a feminine black male as well, it's not as protected as being masculine in the black community. Um, femininity is looked at as like a weakness, a crime. So it's something that we've been talking about amongst each other as ways to better our relationships with each other because a lot of the um, discourse between the opposite sex happens from a very assumption-based standpoint where we just assume what the other gender is thinking of us or we assume what they will do to us or say about us when we aren't there and one of the one of the best ways to kill an assumption is to actually ask the questions to the people you're assuming about. Thank you. Anyone else with a question on the differences or uh, um, so today is International Women's Day. <laughs> Day Women in the room. Day, yes. Um, what's coming up for me, just off the top, I've been married for 10 years, and to Terry's point, communication <laughs> is the key. <laughs> um, it's not the longest, 
you know, I'm sure there's other people in the room who are very longer than that, but I'm proud of that. But I think communication is the key. And to, to Terry's point, like there's a lot of assumptions, not just in like romantic relationships, but in workplace relationships and different styles of communication. Uh, I think um, I learned a lot about that when I was in the fellowship as well, the public policy fellowship. Um, and I think there's a tendency to assume that women are going to come from a more emotional place and that you're going to need to appease to, to our heart in order to get us on your side. Me, I'm a very data-driven person, <laughs> actually. Like, look, what's, what's the data and then where's the story behind it? But I want to, I'm, I'm a data-informed person, and so I think uh, we need to kind of let go of whatever assumptions that we have, take time to get to know um, what drives uh, folks of the opposite and same um, um, gender, and just start with the humanity and take the time to get to know folks um, instead of operating on uh, gender assumptions that really it can be really toxic. I, I think now more than ever, um, yeah, Terry mentioned she grew up in social media and seeing all, I didn't. I grew up where I had to ask a girl to dance, like with my mouth, you know? uh, and I had to engage. So I, I have to work harder now to talk to younger people about everything about them because there's so much information that's coming across the phone, yeah. right? And so I think that that's where the assumptions, like I don't make any assumptions now because how we are defining ourselves are different. How young people are defining themselves are outside of the parent, the family, the community. It's global because they have access to all this other information. So when you break it down to gender, yeah, you just you just got on there too, uh, sometimes happily. <laughs> but you know, you, you got to talk and say, hey, what's up with it? My my wife is both emotional and dad's driven, so you got to do that. But I still have sisters, aunts, you know, nieces, you know, goddaughters, all of that, and I'm always checking in, tapping in with them because if it's some generational, you know, they're younger than me, so I'm like, hey, what's up with you? Like my niece hates when I say, hey, are you dating? <laughs> like, come on, Uncle D. Well, are you? Hey, you got the future of the family in there, right? So I have to say, what's going on? I have to meet your dude, you know, kind of thing. Right. One of my goddaughters, I saw yesterday. I have, I have to meet your boyfriend. You know that kind of stuff, just to just to talk and not to judge or anything, but just right. to learn so I can react better. Yeah. So it is communication, but it's the understanding that we're getting a lot of information about a lot of different things and we don't know how we're subconsciously processing that. So we have to talk about it and say, oh, you're coming from there? All right, well, I'm coming from here. We got some middle ground? Okay, cool, let's work on the middle ground and, and let's let the outliers be the outliers. Right. So then how do you, to the woman, understanding how men may show up or how the communication may be an issue, how do you then show up to make the environment effective or you know just to be successful in it. So I personally am very like I'm an organizer to keep it very short. And with that I can see uh, solutions to problems that other people um, can't see from the outside view. And so when I see an issue of this tension between black men and women on campus, my immediately my immediate response is to create a solution. Create a um, a space where we can actually discuss with one another. To create a space where we can have black women discuss amongst each other. Um, black men also have their space on campus where they can discuss amongst each other too. And I think those spaces are equally as important because Sometimes we just need to vent to each other, to talk to each other, but not in a bashing manner, in a, um, in a solution oriented manner, most of the times. So yeah, like just creating solutions, making sure that everybody is up for the challenge. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so I, happen, I mentioned the infrastructure finance policy that I'm uh, leading advocacy for. Then we have a community steering committee. I'm the only woman in the steering committee. Um, and I'm a very 
put it all on the table early sort of person. I think that's the best strategy, uh, calling the thing a thing. And so um, very early on, we've been meeting since January, I brought to the table to the group that in past experiences, not making any assumptions on how they would show up, but I, I called out the past experiences that I've had in working with an all-male group, saying, you know, in my experience, um, I've shouldered a lot of the administrative load in these predominantly male spaces, and I don't want that to happen here. So I'm letting you know that that's my experience and calling you in to, to um, address that and to show up differently, giving you an opportunity to say, oh, maybe I've been through that too, don't worry, like, what is it that you need so that we can make sure that this doesn't happen here? So I think, um, I think people, I think men, black men, want to address uh, and to show up in a way that honors the needs of other women, and black women specifically. That takes us, again, communicating and sharing what our experiences have been to give folks the opportunity to meet us there and to show up in a way that, that will allow all of us to thrive. Um, real quickly, if anyone wants uh, more breakfast, then we put it at the four minutes, so I'll go ahead and grab it. Breakfast. Um, so thank you for that, uh, Jennifer. So then I know, well, Terry kind of mentioned, I think it's something that in the newer generation, we talk about it a lot, but she mentioned black community and the line is more protected um, than black masculinity. Do you have any thoughts on that? Or? I, I, agree. I agree with Terry. I mean, I see it. Um, I often engage in it too, you know. So I think that, you know, once again, we just, those things are changing. And I honestly think that, you know, this women's movement is, is, is really changing the dynamics between men and women, community, all of that. And because once again, it's a lot of stuff women weren't able to do. And now they're just doing it. So it's cool. Let, let's figure out. Yeah, you know, I mean, I mean, really, if you think about the changes that we're talking about, it's stuff that people weren't able to do. And so now, and people are just saying, oh, that's just the way it is. Okay, we're just going to sit on the back of the bus, all that kind of stuff. But now it's like, oh, nah, we, we, we ain't checking for that. Yeah. And so I think that it, it is, it's just a, it's, it's, it's a transition to how are women defining themselves? What is this femininity? Because I can't define it. Right. I'm, I'm, I'm a dude. You know, I'm a dude. I mean, like, okay, but what is it? Okay, cool. Because right. it's nothing really like life breaking. Right. It's just different. And it's like, oh, okay, cool. You know, like, but I will still open the door yeah. until you say no. And then I'm okay, I'm going to fight. You know, that kind of stuff. Right. That kind of stuff that, that I grew up with, just, just the, the chivalry, if you will. So, but hey, being able to go and, and have the same access and do the same thing and not be administrative and all that kind of stuff, okay, let's figure it out because I still want the highest and best out of the people around me and the women around me. Right. Thank you for that. We have another question from our virtual audience. Jazz, I believe this is not a question as I'm reading it. The students from University of Tennessee Martin, they say, um, while, we, while, while privileges and access become wider, uh, and opportunities become wider, we want to ensure that we're advocating and coaching folks to get to the door through the access that's being made and not take access for granted. And so I think she's spending some time at University of Tennessee Martin ensuring that while these rights have now been given to spaces, let's not take it take, take advantage of it by not, not utilizing those rights. Right. And so I'm pulling for an example. She said voting is a great example. Mm -hmm. You don't wait to vote till you have someone who looks like you running. You understand the platform and then you go vote. Um, you, don't, you don't wait to um, apply for scholarships when there's a need. Make it a behavior and apply for scholarships that are offered all the time. And so I think it's important to recognize a comment from the student in Tennessee that let's champion the rights that we have and not take those rights for granted. Yeah. Um, I could say that that same energy is what drove me, has driven me to run as a young black woman. Um, to David's point, you know, women are just doing <laughs> more things than they could do before. 
This particular district has only been represented by a woman once in its whole history. In California State Senate, there's only ever been six black women, ever. So in, in, in California State Senate, that's wild. <laughs> so if we wait, if I just wait to, you know, until there's more black women occupying these spaces, then I wouldn't be running right now. We just have to seize these opportunities and not um, take the access for granted, as that um, students said. Yes, Dr. Slides, question. Are rumors about that? Question. Yes. <laughs> yeah, so, I was just relaying to um, Dr. Garbage about the generational disconnect uh, around identity. Um, I made the mistake of calling a millennial, she may have been Gen Z, her. And she said, I'm not a her. And we was just like, I didn't know how to respond to that. And so, you know, there was a couple of comments about toxic masculinity, but where, what happens when we run into toxic femininity or toxic non-binary uh, people who really want to insist on their identity and we may not be politically astute, you know, intergenerationally to recognize that, you know. Y'all snap, y'all snap kind of quick. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I, I didn't mean it like that. <laughs> you know? I actually do want to touch on that a little bit, and I'm glad that you brought up like the non-binary aspect, the LGBTQ aspect of gender. Um, I think that a lot of those things, it is a generational disconnect because it is something very new. It's still, me personally, it's still um, something that I slip up on, honestly. But it all comes down to understanding and what you are willing to understand and how willing you are to adapt to somebody's needs. Now, if somebody, um, if an individual is insisting that you should have known or read their minds, that's on them. But if you're not willing to be understanding of that person, just like with you all's generation, um, people calling white people calling you the N word, y'all y'all wasn't feeling that. <laughs> and you know, it took a long time for y'all to get them to stop. I mean, they still kind of do it sometimes, but on a mass scale, they stop. And I think that's the thing that we're going through now with on the topic of gender and pronouns and stuff like that is just trying to learn, trying to understand. As long as you are trying to learn, as long as you're willing to learn and respect them, I think that should be enough. I'll just be quick and, and share a phrase that I learned about, but I think it's specific to this specific um, point. We've all heard of the golden rule, right? Treat others the way you want to be treated. But I think when it comes to um, gender identity, um, we need to take it a step further to what I've heard be called the platinum rule, which is treat others the way they want to be treated. And so if someone else prefers to be called um, a different pronoun than what you would have assigned to them, we need to respect that. And it's as simple as just allowing someone to own their own identity and how they're showing up in the world. This, to me, it's as simple as that. And it takes, takes coming from a place of humility to be able to do that. Yeah, uh, in my introduction, I, I used a cute way of saying that I own beauty supplies uh, stores. Um, I usually don't say beauty supply because it has a bad brain, so I always say beauty retail concept locations. Um, but I come across that a lot. And I, sorry, you know, so, sorry, you know, because if I see you and you have waves, I might think you would do, but then when you turn around, I turn around, so clear mistake. So I always just say, hey, I, I put my hands up. You know, that's another generational thing. Hey, I lean back, hey, I'm sorry. Because I do believe if that's what you want to be called, I'm gonna call you that. And uh, it was a 
couple, it was around the Caitlyn Jenner, Bruce Jenner thing, and it was it was a woman I was just at dinner with, just, uh, just, just we were dining together with a group, and she turned me on that, and I'm like, yeah, you're right. If somebody wanna want, want to be called that, I'm gonna call you that, regardless of what I think. But uh, I'm gonna just call you that. But 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 if I make a mistake, first go. You, you look like you look like a man. I'm gonna call you all the man pronouns. My bad if I didn't know, because I'm now dealing with grandkids, and my six year old he kills me when I wear pink, and I don't know why. Like he hammers me. And I don't know where he got all that stuff from, other than cartoons or whatever, because I know it's not taught in his house. Right. So once again, I always take the high road and say, and I'm in the business and see a lot of all of that. And I say, hey, I'm sorry, I apologize. You want to buy the product? You know, that kind of thing. So, uh, so yeah, I do think it's humility and just saying, hey, it ain't what I, what I necessarily think or learn, but this is what we're dealing with now. Thank you for And they do snap fast. Right. Quick, 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 Particularly the women. The women go go hard and fast because once again, I think it's a it's a rights, privilege, choice, all that. And, and I'm with it because you didn't have that before. So now we make it up. All right, thank you for that. So we're closing soon, but are there any other questions or comments or concerns from the audience that's here with us? No? Well, let's, as far as unity, I think it's a very, it's not sad when we're talking about it, but it's a touchy conversation because there's so many different um, pieces that need to be unified. Um, so as you guys are in leadership and going out into your careers, what is just something that you'll leave with some of the students um, as they are getting ready to enter some of these fields, like on being unified and then going also into these spaces um, and being a part of themselves? I'll say, no great thing is done alone. Great things are done with a mass of people. Great things are done with units, teams, groups, all that kind of stuff. So if you want to do great things, you have to be part of a group, you have to be part of a team, and you have to respect each team member, each group member, and that takes, hey, what gets them going, whether they like, dislikes, once again, how do you get the most out of that person if they're happy and their energy's good and you move together as a group. So when you get into these team environments, whether they're big or small, respect everybody, understand everybody, and be happy with everybody. Yeah, um, thank, first of all, thank you for, for having me. Um, I would leave with this. In order to build unity, you have to have trust. And there's actually a, an equation for trust. <laughs> I, I encourage y'all to look up the trust equation. Um, it's based on uh, reliability, self-orientation, and, and um, actual experience. And so I encourage y'all to look up the trust equation. Um, I'm gonna leave that sort of mathy, taking a not math thing and making it a mathy thing in the spirit of my <laughs> being a CPA. But yeah, I think, I think unity, uh, happens at the base at the pace of trust. Um, I think I want to leave everybody with some good advice that I got entering a leadership role or just through my journey of being in leadership, which is know your why. Once you figure out your why, you will basically be unstoppable because you will know exactly what drives you to do the things that you do. Um, and with that, when you're talking about unity, if you're somebody who wants to unify the black community, if you're somebody who wants to unify the LGBTQ community, know your why. Um, because that is what creates a great leader. A great leader can understand things from, a, from experience and also understand things from a very interpersonal level and not from a talking at people level. So try to connect with your community, whatever community you may identify with in that nation. Well, thank you guys for being great panelists. Thank you. Um, I know we definitely have a lot of conversations on the black community and the way that things affect us, but uh, there's two things that I think you can take away from it as you are in spaces with uh, black people. You can be mindful of these things as you're interacting with them or at, even if you hold higher spaces um, and being mindful of the issues that we brought up here and the ways that we have to show up, but then also you showing up in the communities that you serve in 
with these same issues and just being mindful of that. Um, there's always people that we serve and there's always people that we need to be unified with. So I'm hoping that the conversation wasn't just heard from one lens, but you do understand that it's a revolving door and it can apply to multiple different areas. So we're wrapping up. Let's give it up for our panelists.